James Nestor, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. All right, so your book, Deep, is about uh, this world of free diving. And uh, we'll get into some of these characters who are involved in this world. Uh, I didn't know much about this before I read your book. How did you discover the world of free diving? Uh, did you have an interest in the research, what's going on in the oceans, or was it the the oddities of the human body that led you to it? How did that happen? Well, I grew up near the ocean in illustrious Orange County down in Southern California and uh, had always spent much of my free time in the water, but all of that free time was spent at the surface, uh, surfing or body surfing or boogie boarding when I was young, that kind of thing. And so um, a few years ago, Outside Magazine, who I write for, um, asked me to go cover something called the World Freediving Championship. Now, this is a very weird competition in which competitors challenge one another to see how deep they can dive and come back to the surface conscious. Um, I had never seen anyone free dive before, had certainly never done it myself, didn't know anyone who did it. So I remember on the first day of the competition, sitting out on this boat, I was the only journalist out there, and watching this guy take a single breath and completely disappear into the water. And he didn't return until four minutes later, and he had just dived about 300 feet on a single breath. So this completely blew my mind. Um, I thought the competitive aspect of free diving was pretty ridiculous. People were coming up blacked out with blood on their faces. One guy came up technically dead for two minutes. But something about the human body being able to do this really stuck with me. And uh, one thing led to another. And I ended up uh, pursuing it for the next two years and writing a book about it. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this this sport, it's sort of renegade. Uh, there's, it's, it's sort of on the outskirts of sport because uh, it is so dangerous. It's very dangerous, and the competitive freedivers don't seem to want to admit that it's dangerous because if you have that kernel of doubt while you're doing it, um, you won't be able to do it. It's a, it's a mental sport more than anything else. But I was lucky enough at the competition to meet some other freedivers who took a more holistic and sane approach to freediving, who showed me this completely other side of freediving that had nothing to do with competitions. Um, but, you know, it was almost more of a yogic practice. And that's the side of freediving I focused on. But my entree into this world was through the competition. And uh, I could give you a zillion stories of just how crazy that stuff is. Yeah, yeah. And you talk a lot about those in the book. I'm, I'm curious, like, how is it that the human body is able, you know, we're, we're land animals, right? Yes. How is it that we're able to, hold, people are able to hold their breath four minutes, some people are able to like 20 minutes on a single breath, uh, and then go down to depths of 300, 400 feet, when the just the pressure is just crushing down on your body, but they're able to come back and live. What, what's going on in our bodies when we hold our breath for that long and go underwater that deep? Well, this was something that just completely blew my mind and convinced me that there was something uh, in free diving that I wanted to spend more time researching it and really exploring it. Uh, I learned about something that I'd never heard before called the mammalian dive reflex. And these are a series of triggers in the human body that... Uh, occur the second we put our faces in the water. So, um, you know, the old tradition of splashing your face with cool water to get you to calm down, it's not just psychological, it's physiological. What happens is the second your face touches water, your heart rate's going to lower about 30% of its normal resting rate, and blood is going to start coursing in from your extremities into your uh, chest area into your core, and the deeper you go in water, the more pronounced these reflexes become. Free divers have recorded heart rates as low as seven beats per minute, um, which is by far the lowest anyone has ever recorded a heart rate. And according to physiologists, a heart rate that low can't support consciousness, yet deep in the water it does. And so as the pressure mounts, every 33 feet, the pressure doubles in water. Um, and you feel this. Uh, your chest will shrink up to about half its size at around 300 feet. But the body has all of these incredible mechanisms that only occur in water that protect us 
from from uh, the deep water's pressures. Um, and it, they're the exact same reflexes that dolphins and whales and seals have to protect themselves from diving, you know, thousands and thousands of feet deep. So we have those two. So we're we're really born to do this. Yeah, you call it the uh, the master switch, right? That's right. Uh, some scientists uh, named it the master switch because um, our whole body is like we turn from terrestrial beings to almost aquatic beings the deeper and deeper we go into the water. I know this sounds totally crazy, like some new age dream, but this is all hard science and people have been studying this for over 50 years. And once I learned about that, it, it just really uh, the, the fact that I had never heard of it before and that there was so much more to learn and to research about it really convinced me that there might be an interesting book in here. And is it because we, you know, from a literal sense, come from the water, right? Um, we, we don't know exactly why, just like with all evolution, it was sort of a, a messy route to get to where we are now. Um, you know, some, some markers indicate that that very well could be the case. Uh, the blood right now in, in your veins and my veins and everyone else's veins is about 98% similar to seawater. And the amniotic fluid in which a fetus develops is about 99% seawater. So, uh, you know, is it a coincidence? Well, maybe, but that seems a little too close for me. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say that we've developed these, these skills because in the past we needed them. Uh, people have been free diving for as long as you know, there's been, uh, people have been recording history. So, and even, even before that, there's evidence of free diving 20,000 years ago, all over the world. It's just recently that we've stopped, uh, free diving because we no longer need to go to the sea floor to, to get food. We have fishing boats and nets to do that. So, you know, it's really been a part of our human evolution is being in water and being deep in the water. Are there uh, still any group, like, you know, traditional, I guess, quotation, uh, cultures that still use free diving for a practical purpose, like it's part of their livelihood? Yeah, well, um, you know, in the past, uh, about 400, 400, 500 years ago, the largest fishing fleet in the world was this group of Japanese women uh, called the Ama. And, um, and they just spent their lives from the time they were teenagers till they were very old, um, harvesting urchin and, and abalone and fish and all those good things on the seafloor. And all of the pearl divers from the past, those were all free divers, sponge divers in Greece, all free divers. The, the Vikings were pretty, pretty good free divers. They used to go over to enemy ships and bore holes in the ships, uh, when they weren't looking. So, um, you know, as far as the any of these cultures being around, most people do it recreationally now. But um, I was I was asking myself the same question about a year and a half ago, um, and I went to Japan and actually found some of these ama divers, the the last ama divers who actually do this for a living. One of them was a uh, 82 years old, and she'd been diving every day since she was 16, and she was just like the biggest badass you've ever seen. So uh, it was great to see that, you know, they were keeping the tradition alive, <laughs> at least for now, who knows how long it'll last, but, um, and, and see these people that were just so intimately connected to the ocean. Yeah. And it was really interesting to see their approach compared to like what you said, the competitive free divers where they're just going, they're just crazy. Um, these AMA were able to do a f phenomenal things, but they didn't have that. I don't know. It's like a chip on their shoulder. There's this weird drive they just seemed more like at one with the ocean. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good way of putting it. Um, you know, the AMA in, in all of their recorded history, and there's quite a lot of it, there's no record of them ever competing. And there was no record of them ever having an accident, ever blacking out or dying from doing this. I met, you know, half a dozen AMA who had been literally diving since they were teenagers. They said every day and they were in their 70s and 80s. So the stuff can be practiced in a, in a sane manner. And they just think competitive diving is the stupidest thing of all. It would be like competitive yoga or something like, <laughs> you know, seeing how far your back can bend before you break it. Um, their respect of the ocean and their place in the ocean um, really added a different, uh, you know, a different element and, and a different layer to, to free diving. It was that sort of free diving, this respectful, meditative free diving that I really glommed onto and, and uh, tried to explore in the book. Yeah. And 
I thought it was interesting is that you you highlight besides these free divers and uh, competitive free divers and the AMA, you highlight this band of, and they're like really ragtag scientists. They're independent scientists. Uh, they don't often they don't work with universities. They're just doing the stuff on their own, and they're using free diving as a tool in their research. And they're exploring things like sharks, whales, and dolphins. What kind of research are these free diving scientists doing? with dolphins and whales and sharks that are uh, helping us learn new things about the ocean that we didn't know. Yeah, well, that's what I thought was so cool to, to discover along my, my many travels for this book is this isn't only just like a recreation, um, something that people did in the past and, you know, something they're, people are doing just for their, their own edification. Um, I, I discovered a number of people who are free diving and using this for scientific research because something else amazing happens when when you're diving. Not only does your body transform, but a, a paradigm shift occurs in in the water. When you sort of try to explore other oceanic animals with scuba or with submarines, uh, and I'm sure many of your listeners have have done this, most of the time everything swims away from you. Scuba is very loud. Um, and same with submarines and boats. But when you free dive, you are completely silent. So you no longer become a viewer into this other world, but an active part of it. And instead of all these animals swimming away, they start surrounding you and enveloping you in their shoals. And it gets very, very weird very quickly. So um, a few researchers were using free diving to get closer to whales and dolphins than anyone has before. And because they have this, this such intimate access to these animals, they're recording data that no one else has collected. And so that's what I ended up focusing on a lot of like how much we're learning about these animals and our connection to them and their language and all that through this free diving, free diving as a tool, not, not just as a recreation and especially not as a sport. Yeah, so the, the the stuff coming out about dolphins and their language and, and whales as well was crazy. You're reading it and you're like, man, this is like, you know, Ripley's Believe It or Not type <laughs> stuff or things you'd see on the Learning Channel at 2 o'clock in the morning. So there's, thing, there's this theory, one of these freediving um, researchers has this theory about what is going on with dolphins when they're communicating with one another and that they're actually transmitting holographic images <laughs> through this yeah. this is like ancient alien stuff going on so can you explain a little bit what what's i mean that that theory yeah it if it sounds insane to everyone then then uh it sounded equally as insane to me and so uh, we're all in the same boat um what happened is uh in the 1960s scientists were absolutely convinced that dolphins and whales were communicating. So they took them into the labs. The US Navy did tons of research into dolphin communication. They're still doing it. They, At one time, they apparently translated a bunch of dolphin words and sentences and were holding these stunted conversations with them. They had a lab in the Bahamas and they were holding English immersion workshops with dolphins. I mean, I felt bad time. for the lady that was... Uh... <laughs> That was the English teacher. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? She was uh, it was fully consensual dolphin sex. We'll we'll leave the details, you know, <laughs> in, in the book. But but uh I don't really feel bad. I mean, she she kind of was was the one instigating it. So so she knew what she was doing. Um <laughs> and uh maybe I feel bad for her now. Yeah. You know, the next morning something like that must must uh feel a little strange. Yeah. But um what they and so for wow this is so complicated but I'm going to try to give you the cliff notes version here. Um, dolphins and whales don't hear sounds with two ears with two points of uh, to collect data, but with literally tens of thousands of points underneath their jaws. So they have the equivalent of tens of thousands of ears, and uh, we know they're viewing the world through sonographic images. This is scientifically proven. Something called echolocation. They send out a click. They wait to hear all of the data from that click, how it comes back, and they form a picture in their mind from that. Um, all of these researchers believe that they're also able to send these sonographic images to one another. They're already viewing the world this way. Um, they're probably sending the, the equivalent um, uh, holographic sonographic images to one another. So uh, th this is not something, some crazy new age theory. People have been studying this 
or trying to study it for so long, but no one's been able to get close enough to these animals to do any real research. And these free diving researchers are the first people able to get close enough to them in their wild environment to really research them. And so currently right now, we've got a team of physicists, mathematicians, coders, you name it, and um, they're building the equipment. And next year, we're going to be doing this, um, collecting these sonographic images and shooting them back to them, trying to have a conversation not with words and sentences, but with shapes. Crazy. And, uh, yeah, yeah, but it's it's happening. It's real. It's science. It's not some flaky thing. And uh, it could be a really big deal if we don't all die. Yeah, and it's all all because of free diving. And what does like like mainstream like universities and researchers and scientists think of these free diving? Are they sort of welcomed in that community? They're sort of like, no, those guys are sort of the, the weird cousins at the family reunion. We don't really associate with. <laughs> Well, uh, a little of both. It's starting to change. A few years ago, um, many researchers thought what these guys were doing was uh, extremely cruel to the animals. They thought, oh, the animals should be left alone, study them from a boat. But what they didn't get is it's always the dolphin and the whale's choice to free dive and to swim with us. Like at any time, they can turn around and take off and dive. So when you study them, you get in the water, a boat drops you off, you get in the water, the boat takes off, and it's just you in the water, and they can either choose to come to you or choose to go away. So they're, they're willingly having these encounters, and these encounters last like four, four hours. They surround you, they orient themselves vertically, like all of this weird shit starts happening. So um, that that's one thing. And another thing is institutional researchers can't swim uh, with these animals, A, they don't know how to free dive. B, um, they would never be able to do that, um, you know, for insurance reasons. You can't swim with a 60 foot long animal with eight inch long teeth. Uh, you know, no university is going to allow research assistants to do that. So these guys are working completely independently and they can do whatever the hell they want, um, which is fantastic. And that's why they're making such fast progress right now. And how are they making, how do they get their funding for this stuff? <laughs> well, that's always a tricky thing. Um, they get uh, a lot of their funding uh, from donations, and they've also gotten some funding because they're starting to film these encounters in 360 for virtual reality because all of these headsets, if uh, people don't know what that is, oh, you will come <laughs> Christmas time uh, because Sony, Samsung, you know, Facebook, they're all releasing virtual reality headsets. So, uh, and they work jobs, uh, you know, and that, that to me is what was so cool about what they were doing. They're, they're not doing it for money. Uh, it's something that they've just already invested so much of their time and own money in doing it. They're doing it because no one else is going to do it. And they've got access to these animals that, uh, no one else has had before. And to me, it's like incredibly exciting. I spent, you know, a few expeditions with them, saw their research, swam with, with dolphins and whales, and um, and now I really get what they're trying to do. It's a pretty profound experience being next to this animal, which could eat you in a freaking second, but instead chooses to sit there and send you communication clicks. Yeah, we want to talk about your own experience with the uh, the whales doing free diving, but bringing back this idea that we're somehow connected to the ocean or these connected to these animals in some way, like this ability to use sonar to guide yourself around the world isn't just unique to bats or dolphins or whales. Like humans can do it too. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it seems pretty abstract when you start thinking about, oh, you know, how, how can a, a dolphin and whale really see with the frequencies of sound? How can they use this echolocation? Well, it turns out there's a bunch of blind activists in LA that have been doing this for, for a decade and uh, teaching a bunch of other blind people how to do it just the same. And what they do is they use the exact same practice as, as dolphins and whales. They send out a click from their mouths, just like a... And they listen for how that click echoes off of everything uh, around them, and they form a picture from that. And um, these guys have are, are able to ride their bike um, in... Um, sorry... I'll just start that over. And these guys are able to ride their bikes in busy city streets, just clicking and listening to 
goes. They camp alone in the woods. I saw this guy ride down a, a flight of stairs <laughs> on his mountain bike. Uh, they're able to live completely independent lives by using this echolocation, the same echolocation that dolphins and whales use. And, and something really interesting is that some researchers took them, put them in an fMRI and looked at what was happening in their brains as they were using this echolocation. And uh, they found that their visual cortexes lit up. So there was really no difference from what these guys were seeing with the frequencies of sound to what you and I and other sighted people can see with the frequencies of light. It was the same thing in their brains, and, um, and they were literally able to see with their eyes closed. And it really blew my mind. Crazy. So you you start the book off. I want to talk about it because I thought it was funny. It made me laugh. Uh, there was, or I think there still is now because it got funding again, this underwater uh, research facility. And when I read about it, it reminded me going back to like when I was a kid, I remember reading these science books back in the 80s about the future would be like we live in these underwater cities and like we drive submarines to like different locations to see grandma and it'd be awesome. Uh, was it as awesome as these science fiction books made them out to be. Well, I don't want to ruin that dreamy vision you have in your head. So maybe you should just plug your ears right now when I tell you the true reality of it. It's uh, it's really hard to live underwater. There's this place called Aquarius, which is about the size of a Winnebago, and it's under about 60 feet of water in the Florida Keys. And uh, scientists live down there for up to 30 days at a time. And um, and it was one of the strangest places uh, I've I've ever been in my life. Um, there are so many challenges to living underwater. There's the pressure. There's the fear that everything might go wrong all of a sudden, and you have to bail out. There's the bends. Um, if these people are stay in this pressurized capsule, so uh, if they chose at any time to suddenly just freak out and go to the surface, their blood would literally boil in their veins. They had to be very slowly decompressed over a number of days in order to go back to the surface. So that was my first entree into uh, sort of institutional research. You know, they're doing very, <laughs> very cool stuff down there. It's, it's really neat. Um, but then again, I just felt so completely removed from uh the ocean and that connection with the ocean um you know you're always in scuba you're always in a wetsuit you're behind three inches of steel looking out of a window and it's a pretty big difference going from that to being free diving in a pair of swim trunks you know with a bunch of whales and just having these face-to-face -face interactions so that seemed like a much more direct approach was to follow the more renegade line of research, yeah. which is what I did. So no more, so no future sit underwater cities. <laughs> well, you know, they tried to do that in the sixties and seventies. Cousteau had a place, uh, it's still off the coast of Sudan. So you can go there and, uh, you can actually live in his little underwater hut. It's still there. It's just like traveling in Sudan right now is really sketchy. Yeah. That's why I've <laughs> been there. But Germany had them, Italy had them, Japan had them, U.S. had many of them, and everyone was just like, okay, we're going to colonize the ocean. And then once everyone spent a couple of days down there in this damp, humid environment, eating dried food and looking out this <laughs> little window into a, a dark mass, everyone was like, screw this, let's go to space. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's what happened. That's funny. All right. So let's get back to this idea of direct experience with the ocean. So you weren't just um, writing about these guys. You were you actually trained to become a free diver. Um, what was that training like? And what was the culmination of that for you? Yeah, I had uh, the first couple of assignments when I went out to see what they were doing, um, researching sharks and researching dolphins and whales. I was stuck on the boat the whole time. And I was watching these guys from the boat in this like crystal clear water having these experiences. And I thought, damn, that looks pretty good. Um, and I also thought like, if, I, if I'm going to write about this stuff, I need to experience it myself. I didn't want to be lazy, sit behind a desk and write about it. I, I wanted to get in there. So um, I did uh, start training for free diving. And I'll just make something clear to the readers. This free diving, uh, it gets lumped in with 
base jumping all the time. And uh, these two activities are so like with base jumping, you have to jump off a cliff or an antenna or a bridge. And each time you base jump is dangerous. But free diving, people don't get you don't need to go down 300 feet to do it. You can go down 10 feet or 15 feet or five feet or whatever depth is comfortable for you. Um, and so, you know, I learned about that. And I also learned that this is a very it's a mental activity or our bodies are built to dive deep. We have all these ref reflexes. We're born to do this. But getting your mind to convince yourself that you can stay underwater for four minutes takes a bit of time. Um, but eventually I was able to get there. And uh, it's just the coolest thing I've, I've ever done in my life. And you know, since the book came out, I've been free diving more now than, than I ever have. And I just think about it all the time. Oh, so you're still doing it? All the time. Yeah, this wasn't some some flighty thing where I was just like, oh, I'm going to check that out and then, you know, move on to, to driving race cars. Uh, <laughs> although that would be cool. Agents out there, I'm, I'm here. I'm ready to roll. But, uh, I, you know, for me, it was once I had the experience of, of actually feeling all of those reflexes within my own body and learning what I was capable of, learning how easy this stuff was, um, learning that it could be done in a very safe and respectable and, and meditative way. Um, it's, it's just, it's such an incredible experience. I'll never be able to afford intergalactic travel. Um, but you know, this is about as close as you can get. There's no gravity down there or, or you're entirely weightless. You can do whatever you want. Uh, animals come up to you. It's just, it's uh, it's a very magical experience, and uh, it's something I just can't wait to repeat. And I'm going free diving in a couple weeks uh, in in Japan to to do exactly that. So that's all. I mean, if, if someone who's listening does, how do you get started with that? Right? Are there schools you can go to? Uh, how do you get started with free diving? The the best thing to do is to take a course because they teach you about the safety. They teach you this is not some reckless extreme thing where you push yourself to your limit and come back out of breath. You know, it's it's a meditative practice. It's a yogic practice. You have to respect your body and your your place in the ocean. So, a course is the best thing. I think Performance Freediving International teaches great courses. It's really no bullshit. Um, they teach you about safety first, and then they just take you step by step through the process. Um, you know, a lot of people do this uh, with friends too, uh, but it's it's better to me to know the mechanics of your body and and how to breathe up properly and and all of the safety first. So uh, I took a course with uh, PFI Performance Freediving International. Really, really liked it, and I know some other people that did as well. Cool. So, James, what, what are you working on next? What's your next big project? Are you going to explore some other facet of human physiology that's mind-blowing? We're right now working on a documentary of Deep focused on, on the cetacean, uh, dolphin, and whale communication. And what we're hoping to do is to film these experiments as they happen. Um, so, I've been dedicating most of my time to that um you know for about three or four months we've been writing proposals and trailers and all that i also have another book idea which i'm cooking up right now but uh haven't found too much time to do that and uh you know uh i, I just want to stay in the ocean a little bit longer i'm not quite ready to to hop into something else and uh i think the potential of these free diving researchers to really make historical scientific breakthrough here is is going to be very possible in the next couple of years and i'd love to assist them and be a part of that awesome well james nestor thank you so much for your time it's been a pleasure thanks a lot our guest today was james nestor he's the author of the book deep freediving renegade science and what the ocean tells us about ourselves and it's available on amazon.com